So I'm Brent Sleep. I'm the Chair of Civil and Mineral Engineering, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Civil and Mineral Engineering Distinguished Lecture. It's the virtual edition, as we've been doing since March of last year. I'm very pleased that our distinguished speaker today is Professor Genevieve Giuliano from the University of Southern California. So as we begin, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So we've been running this uh, Distinguished Lecture Series now in the department for four or five years, and we invite leaders from around the world who are conducting great innovative research in the civil and mineral engineering domains. We've had lots of great speakers. And uh, for today's lecture, I'm also uh, pleased to note that we're partnering with the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute, or UTRI as we call it, and also with a relatively new organization in the department and the faculty in the university, the Smart Freight Centre. The chair of the Smart Freight Center is Matthew Rorda. Matt is a professor in civil and mineral engineering, and he holds a tier two Canada research chair in freight transportation and logistics, clearly very uh, relevant to our distinguished lecture today. So Matt, would you like to introduce Professor Giuliano? Sure, thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Genevieve, for joining us today. And thanks to everybody in the audience. It's really uh, thrilling to see such a great turnout. Um, I really wish this could be in person and really wish that we could have invited Jen to come and give her a tour of campus and go for lunch and the usual things that we would normally do with this distinguished uh, lecture visit. But um, I'd like to thank uh, Jen for the time that she spent earlier today with some of our students uh, and also for um, presenting to us today the distinguished lecture. Um, here's what we're going to do today. In addition to uh, the, the lecture, we also were going to have uh, a panel uh, taking place afterwards. And I'm not going to introduce the panelists now. We're going to introduce the panelists after, the, after Jen's talk. Um, and uh, there will be opportunity for questions as well once the talk is finished. So uh, we're going to be using the chat for questions. So just uh, uh, we can, you can put them in the, in the, in the chat, I think, during the talk or or afterwards during the, the panel session. <clears throat> so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished lecturer. Professor Giuliano is the Margaret and John Ferrero char, uh, Chair in Effective Local Government and Director of the Metrans Transportation Center at the University of Southern California, Seoul Price School of Public Policy. And her research areas include, there's a lot of research areas I know after uh, what, following her work for many years, um, uh, but they include relationships between land use and transportation, transport policy analysis, travel behavior, information technology applications and transport. And some of her current research includes uh, examination of relationships between urban form and online shopping behavior and freight demand, which I think has increased dramatically during COVID-19. Uh, market potential for zero emission trucks, which you'll be hearing about today, reducing local impacts of truck traffic and applications for transport system analysis using real-time data. Uh, she works with state governments, with Caltrans and with uh, the California Air Resources Board on implementation of the California Sustainable Freight Action Plan. She also has many leadership roles over the years in uh, research and academic communities, has received distinguished scholarships and service awards. And if I began to list those, there would be not enough time for the lecture. So uh, I would like to uh, thank Genevieve for joining us today and pass the floor over. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And um, I really appreciate it. I thank everyone here for the invitation. I too wish I could be in Toronto instead of Los Angeles. It's one of my very favorite cities and I haven't been there in a while. Uh, so um, uh, 
I'm at least imagining the beauty that, that Toronto is while I'm giving this, this presentation today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, and um, if all goes well, uh, I will be finished right within the time period <clears throat> and no technological glitches will happen. Okay, so let's share. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. Uh, so we're going to talk about heavy duty trucks and what I'm calling the challenge of getting to zero. So um, per usual, we'll start out just with an outline of the talk. I'm going to sort of talk about the motivation that generated this, uh, the interest in the topic in the first place our research approach, um, our simulation results. We did some scenario analysis, we did some case studies, and then we put all that together in conclusions. I want to particularly thank my research team. Um, all of the people that you see listed there were participants in what I'm presenting to you today. Uh, Majid Desuki is my colleague in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, Sue Dexter, Jane Fang are my PhD students. Shi Chung Hu is Majid's PhD student. And then Marshall Miller uh, is at UC Davis um, and was uh, very instrumental in some of the cost estimations. So you can see from the beginning that we have a very interdisciplinary team here and it's a very interdisciplinary project. <clears throat> so let's talk about the challenge, which of course is all about increasing freight demand. I probably don't have to say much to this audience about the fact that we are in a continuing era of globalization of manufacturing and trade. Um, and globalization of course brings with it uh, all sorts of um, transportation. Uh, the only, one of the reasons we have globalization is that it's of course cheaper to produce things in different parts of the world and ship them back and forth <clears throat> than it is to produce them in the same place that they're being consumed. Um, you have all I'm sure experienced and are probably part of the rapid increase in e-commerce. Um, when we think simply about e-commerce from the, from the consumer's point of view, we don't think a lot about how that affects supply chains and distribution networks, uh, but it really has a great effect. And in particular, uh, it does two things. First of all, it fragments freight shipments, uh, which means that all else equal, we've got more truck miles on the road. Um, and it also is engendering um, a constant um, increase in expectations regarding rapid delivery. Uh, and so we've gone from one week deliveries to one day deliveries, and now we're at two hour deliveries. Uh, and all of that again, adds to fragmentation. The other, the other issue uh, is that last mile transportation is overwhelmingly uh, performed by trucks. Um, and as we get better at reducing emissions from other places, the share of emissions that trucks account for keeps growing. So in California, for example, um, of the, um, of all of the sources of, let's say, um, particulate matter, uh, trucks are about 30% of the transport sector's portion of that, even though trucks are not 30% of the vehicles in the fleet. So our big question, of course, is how can, reduce, how we, how can we reduce those truck emissions uh, to achieve both the health goals and the climate change reduction, GHG reduction goals that we uh, are so concerned about. 
The research consists of three research questions that we're going to address today. The first one is, what is the market for zero emission heavy duty trucks in 2020, 2025, and 2030? Uh, the question is, if we want to dramatically reduce emissions from trucks, it's unlikely that we're going to do that by reducing truck travel, given the trends that we're looking at. So the alternative is to make the trucks themselves cleaner. Uh, the second question is, what is the impact of using zero emission trucks on fleet operations costs and GHG emissions? And then third, what markets could be efficiently served by zero emission trucks given current and expected performance attributes? Well, as you know, I'm sitting here in Southern California uh, and California provides a great opportunity for studying questions like this. And one of the reasons it does so is because we have the strictest GHG reduction targets and regulations uh, in the nation. Uh, we have been at this since 2006 uh, when we uh, passed the first global climate change regulation. Um, and of course, in California, we go all the way back to the 1960s uh, for controls on air pollution. So California was far ahead of the federal government uh, in the US. We have very ambitious targets for decarbonization. Uh, we have very strict regulations that essentially are technology forcing and therefore are promoting a lot of experimentation. One of the things that we are doing in California is funding a very large number of demonstrations and those demonstrations provide operational data. Uh, California is definitely, I think, a pioneer in demonstrating zero and near zero truck performance. Uh, we have currently out there on the road, uh, we have, um, in excess of 50 heavy duty trucks in Southern California running around. Uh, we have various types of hybrids running around in test operations. Uh, and then we also have two um, hydrogen fuel cell trucks in the state of California. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of all of this data um, and we're using the actual experience on the ground as a starting point to conduct our analysis. So what you're going to see is that our numbers for 2020 are quite different from the numbers in 2025 and 2030 because the 2025 and 2030 numbers are based on forecasts um, in terms of techno technological performance for zero emission vehicles. So what did we do? Well, the first thing we did was say, let's talk about the drayage market. And the drayage is, very, is basically a short haul market that is oriented to um, serving international trade uh, locally. Uh, since we know that zero emission um, heavy duty trucks have very limited ranges. We've got to think about where's the market where there are short trips that would be more feasible for these trucks. Um, we decided to consider two different alternatives relative to conventional diesel. The first one is battery electric. And the reason that we do battery electric um, is that it's the only type of zero emission heavy duty truck available in the marketplace today. Um, secondly, we um, look at natural gas hybrid electric vehicles um, as another potential choice. We developed a simulation model that's actually based on actual operational data from the ports. Uh, we estimate the number of trucks that are required to perform the same set of pickups and deliveries. Uh, and then we use the models to compare the results on costs, emissions, uh, reductions, uh, and so on for the different scenarios. And then finally, we supplement our model estimations with case studies. 
So first let's talk about the simulation. Um, what we did was do an optimization for routing and scheduling, um, looking at different shares of electric vehicle trucks in the fleet. So um, we started out with what if you add one truck, what if, and then we went on to uh, how many can you possibly add, how much of the total pickup and delivery activity can actually be performed by the electric truck. As I said, we used actual drayage operational data from a port survey, um, and then we did simulations based on that data for the three target years. Uh, you will see uh, in our early uh, results that you won't see the hybrid electrics because they have the same performance as diesels. So we don't really have to uh, do a separate simulation for them. So the big question is how many trucks are needed to perform all the pickups and deliveries when we add battery electrics to the fleet? Okay, so here's our very simple um, simulation. Uh, we started out with only two types of tours, and those of you who are, know this area know that these are oversimplified tours, but we start out with um, trips to and from the port, so just a simple load in, load out, um, or uh, two stops before returning back to the port, in which case um, it's taking a load out, then an empty trip from A to B, and then a load in from B to the port. Okay. You have to make a whole bunch of assumptions when you do this kind of work. So we assume that all the trucks start from the port and return to the port. Uh, we count demand as the number of containers moved. Uh, and they only exist between the port and other locations. Uh, we assume that containers are either fully loaded or empty, so there's no half loaded containers. Uh, we, there's three different operational states. You can carry no container, you can carry an empty container, and you can carry a full loaded container. And then e for each of those, we have different power consumption rates both for the electric vehicles and for the battery vehicles. Um, all, of, all the battery electric, of course, are battery powered and all the charging takes place at the port. Uh, we don't allow refueling detours for any truck. So the truck has to be fully loaded at the point at the beginning of the day. And the truck only operates one eight hour shift. Okay. So the simulation approach itself, this is my colleagues, Majid Dasuki and Shichin, um, was broken into two parts. One part is the minimum cost circulation problem. And in that a part of the problem, we say, okay, uh, there's a set of demands out there, containers that have to be moved from A to B and B to A and so on at each location. Um, and we want to find out what is the optimal, the minimum cost number of vehicle trips that start and end at the port that serve all the demands. So the first stage gives us the set of vehicle trips. Okay, then the next stage is called, is called the bin packing problem. Uh, and then what we do is we say, now we have all these vehicle trips, how many vehicles do we need to actually serve all those trips? Um, it is pointed out that this is a heuristic type solution, not an optimal solution. Okay. Um, this is some of the um, simulation parameters. I just wanna call your attention to a couple of things. Um, over here, if you can see my pointer, um, for each year we have what is the range in miles for the battery electric when it's loaded, empty, and has no container? So I wanna call your attention to 
these are the real figures that re were reported to us by people driving the trucks. Uh, these in 2025 and 2030 are based on projections. Uh, okay. We also um, assumed, you can see by these increases in range, that we're taking all of the increasing power of the battery and we're pouring it into more miles rather than shorter charge times. So the charge times uh, stays constant for the entire um, period. So here's the first set of results, and this is the number of vehicles that are required. So we start out in 2020, and the orange bars that you see here are the number of diesel trucks, and the yellow bars are the number of zero emission trucks or battery electric trucks, okay? So we start out, if we have only diesel trucks, we only need um, 19 trucks in the fleet, okay? Uh, as we add, battery electric trucks, we need more trucks because the battery electric trucks cannot go as far given their limited range. So in the case of 2020, we can serve 75% of all of the jobs, all of the pickups and deliveries uh, with a mix of diesel uh, and electric, but our vehicle fleet size goes up to 36, um, and we cannot allocate any more trips past this point because they're all too long for the uh, BET to actually handle the trip. Okay, 2025, things change dramatically because now we're in the world of projections and we expect a lot of pro progress in terms of battery power. Um, and so here's our 19 trucks, um, and it's now possible to do 96% of all of the uh, all of the work, uh, and the vehicles maximum vehicle fleet size ends up 26 rather than 36. So essentially, you only need seven more um, trucks in order to operate at that rate. And then of course, when we get to 2030, uh, we do even better. The vehicle fleet size drops to 23, uh, but there's still that little bit of um, the operations that are just too long for the BET to be able to operate. So now we use that data to compare the costs and emissions reductions. So we have four scenarios here. The baseline is all diesel. Um, the second, the first alternative is all hybrid. Uh, and then we decided we would try the maximum possible BET and then the midpoint where we have sort of half and half, half diesel, half BET, okay? We look at three criteria pollutants, PM 2.5, NOx, and CO2. Uh, in our CAS, in our costs, we include capital costs that are annualized. This is for the vehicles themselves. Um, the operating and maintenance costs, we add driver costs because we have different numbers of vehicles in these scenarios. Um, we do not include fueling infrastructure costs. So this is um, a very limited analysis in, at this point. So here are the annual costs as they work out. Um, and as you can see, first of all, in terms of capital costs, the all diesel is always gonna be the cheapest because the new diesel is about $110,000 or so. Uh, the hybrids are about 120. Uh, and of course the BETs are about 300. So they're always gonna be expensive. Um, if we look at vehicle operating costs, um, the all hybrid wins in terms of just operating costs in the 2020 timeframe, but then we get better news for BETs here in the outer years. Uh, for driver operating costs, 
they're always going to be the lowest for the diesel and hybrid because there's no extra vehicles involved here. So if we put all of that together, what we see is that the all hybrid um, alternative tends to dominate in terms of costs. Okay, um, what about emission savings? Well, emission savings is a very different picture. Uh, if you want to get rid of PM 2.5, um, the way to do that, these are emission savings. So these are tons removed, right? Um, so the bigger number is better. Uh, so the way to do that is with the battery electric, okay? Um, and in, in fact, the maximum battery electric. Uh, for NOx, the first year hybrids, and this is all relative to diesel, by the way, um, the hybrids do better, but in the out years, the battery electric do better. And then of course, for CO2, uh, the battery electrics do better. So if our main and primary objective is to reduce emissions, then BETs make a lot of sense. Now, if we just look at the comparison of costs per unit of emissions removed, uh, we get this picture. Um, and these numbers in parentheses mean cost savings. So it would actually be relative to diesel. It would actually be cheaper uh, per ton removed to have an all hybrid for LEAT uh, for every single pollutant. You can see that um, we get some savings in 2030 uh, for the BET, okay? Uh, but until 2030, uh, there's always a cost. And in 2020, of course, the cost is very large. Um, I would like to also note that the midpoint battery electric, that is to say the half and half fleet, never wins. Uh, and that's because you kind of have the worst of both worlds. Okay, so findings on the simulations. Checking my time here, yes. Um, between 2020 and 2025, uh, we have a big difference and that was because of using actual data. I'm gonna run through these very quickly because I've explained most of this and I'm running out of time. I wanna give you a few examples of our case studies before I close. Um, we produce, um, a lot of, um, the, it's clear that there's this huge trade-off here. So if cost is no object, we would invest in BETs. If cost is an object uh, and we want more cost-effective emission reduction, then we might think about another alternatives. Um, clearly, when we take the operational constraints into account, we get very different results, um, at least in, the United States, many of the studies that have been done just on electric vehicles simply assume a one-to-one -one substitution. So they just assume that I can take one diesel truck out of the fleet and I can put another battery electric in and I'm fine. Uh, that's not what happens when you actually look at operations. Okay, so um, a few caveats. Um, remember that we simulated some really simple trips and actual operations are much more complicated. We did not consider on our simulation gross vehicle weight limits. Uh, we assumed everybody had an eight hour shift. Uh, we didn't, as I said before, we didn't talk about charging infrastructure costs, um, nor did we make any consideration about um, where you would store the ex extra vehicles. So the bottom line here is that if we did this, the cost on the BET would all go up. So there's no bias uh, against the BET here. Okay, let me very quickly talk about our case studies. Uh, so what we did knowing that our simulation model is pretty simplistic is to say, let's go out in the field and see if we could actually get real data um, on the details of freight operations. 
uh, and then use those details to actually estimate what share of pickups and deliveries as they are actually done out on the street uh, could be done by BETs accounting for their performance and their weight restrictions, which we didn't account for before. Um, some of you who are in this field know that it's not so easy to get detailed data. Uh, so we got um, literally one month of data from each of these companies uh, that had absolutely every driver, every assignment, every load, every weight, et cetera, et cetera. And we could not have picked two different, two more different companies. The first one, uh, most of its business was in drayage and other types of direct delivery. It was mainly a chemical and liquid and dry bulk, I'm sorry, that says dry bulk, um, uh, operation, okay? Uh, the other term, the other firm was a, um, a natural foods um, distribution operation, uh, which did both drayage to and from the ports and direct store delivery of natural foods. Um, in the case of firm one, all the trucks were owned either by the firm or the owner operator. In firm two, all the trucks were leased. In firm one, there were employee drivers and owner operator drivers. Uh, in firm two, there were only employee drivers. In firm one, the trucks operated one shift per day. Uh, in firm two, the trucks operated almost 24 hours a day. So they were alternating employees across the entire time clock. Okay, so uh, what did we do to try to figure this out? Well, the first thing we had to do was define what we mean <laughs> so that we could measure something. Uh, so we started out with trips, which are origin destination pairs without any stops and carrying the same weight, okay? A tour is any combination of trips that start and end at the firm location in a calendar day. So a tour could be many, many trips. It could be one, it could be a, a go and a come. Then we created daily routes, which was all the tours conducted by a single truck in a 24 hour period. And we had to do that because firm two, as I said, was operating nearly 24 hours. Uh, then we uh, categorized all of the trips, all of the tours, all of the daily routes into distance categories that you see there. Uh, we calculated energy consumption based on the tractor trailer weight. Um, so the tractor trailer could be um, coming without any um, um, any trailer, it, it would come with an empty container, it could come with a full container. And we assumed that all the charging would be at the home yard. So here's how the daily distance uh, turns out um, and the single tours turn out. So here's the distribution from firm one for the single tours in these baskets. So you can see that in terms of single trips, right? Most of them are less than 40 miles um, and probably something close to two thirds of them are less than 80 miles. So if you just looked at that, you would say, well, certainly we could, we could operate all these with electric vehicles. Um, so on a single tour, that makes sense. But then we have to think about daily distance. So a daily distance is everything that that truck is doing over the course of one day. So even for firm one, although there's one eight hour shift, you can see that they're out there for a lot of miles over that eight hour shift. So 50 per, over half uh, are over 120 miles. Here's firm two. Um, the single tours, right, are pretty short, uh, you know, are longer. The modal uh, is here in the 40 to 80 mile range. 
but when we talk, when we towed up the daily distance, two thirds of them are over 120 miles. So you can see already that there's gonna be a different picture here between the two firms. This is just a picture to give you an idea of the distance distribution and these color codings. Uh, this is zero to 40, 40 to 80 and so on. So I just wanted to show you this to show you um, how much longer uh, these, these, tour, these daily distances are for firm two. Okay, so here's our results. Um, here's our assumed battery capacity, exactly the same as our simulations. And so what we do now is we say, okay, what's the total share of truck days over that 30 day period um, that could be served with battery electric with and without weight limits? So without weight limits for firm one in 2020, we could do 30% of the business as it is today with trucks as they're on the road today, electric vehicles. Um, if we add weight limits, that drops to 18% because of course batteries weigh roughly 5,000 pounds uh, and most trucking um, is going at near weight. So our, in California, in the United States, uh, the weight limit is 80,000 pounds. Um, you can see that more and more of the activity can be accomplished in the out years. Um, and we get to over half, even with weight limits in the year 2030. Okay. If we look at firm two, uh, even without limits, weight limits. They run those trucks so many hours of the day, there's no time to charge them. So there's almost no, none of the business that can be done um, with the trucks. Um, if we go out to 2030, we get a high number for without weight limits. However, because the range of the trucks has increased so much, however, if we impose a weight limit, we're down to 22%. So the weight limit really matters um, when we look at real live activity. So that's it. Um, one of the things we definitely learned was that the short haul market is very diverse and complicated. Uh, we're looking for a third case study as we speak um, to try to find somebody who's kind of in the middle. Um, our best guess of near-term penetration is probably in the 10 to 15% range um, due to the intensive use of fleet vehicles. Um, and of course, there are many institutional and operational barriers. To conclude, uh, the market for BEVs has been heavily influenced by rain is heavily influenced by range and weight and operating practices. Um, at least from where we're sitting, the transition to BETs in the 2020s will be more costly than most people are anticipating. Um, transition depends on the, the greatly on the progress of battery technology, charging infrastructure, and grid capacity. Um, if Tesla um, you know, if Tesla makes good on its promise, that would be a great breakthrough. Um, if battery technology does improve as expected, that will be great. Um, but those things, of course, remain to be seen. Uh, the other thing that I think from a public policy standpoint comes out loud and clear is that this transition will depend heavily on subsidies. Uh, there will be a need to offset upfront vehicle costs uh, to offset the cost of stranded assets, to invest in charging facilities, and uh, to offset the cost of restructuring freight operations. So with that, I'm going to close. I think I came close to my 40 minutes. I hope I did. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the people who actually supported the research, which is the South Coast Air Quality Management District and the California Department of Transportation. So thank you very much.
And thank you, Jen. I'm uh, just going to bring up a bit of a share here myself. Uh, share to, there, to share the lovely artwork that uh, the Department of Civil Engineering prepared in honor of your, you joining us as a distinguished lecturer in the Department of Civil and Min Mineral Engineering. So thank you very much. I really wish uh, all the people on the call were actually with me to thank you for your talk. But of course, they're not really joining us, they're only listening in. But on behalf of all the people listening in, thank you so very much for joining us today and thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm Dr. Judy Fravolden. I'm the Executive Director of the Transportation Research Institute at the University of Toronto. We call it UTRI. And now it's my pleasure to moderate a panel of a couple of key stakeholders. Unfortunately, Dr. Laura Monet is not able to join us, but we are very happy to welcome Carolyn Kim from the Pembina Institute and Anand uh, Johal, changing now, um, of Pride Group Enterprises. And both will make a short statement about the challenges and opportunities that they see in our region, apropos the lessons learned from the lecture that we just heard. And then we'll invite Professor Giuliano to join us uh, for a bit of a moderated discussion. And then we'll open the floor to questions. So please type your questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of them in turn and let them stay, make a couple of comments, um, starting with Carolyn. Carolyn Kim is the Regional Director of Ontario at the Pembina Institute. Pembina is Canada's foremost clean energy think tank on energy and environmental issues. They have immersed themselves in the freight issue. Carolyn and Pembina advance practical solutions that support a clean and efficient transportation system in Canada. Carolyn, uh, what lessons might be learned for policymakers in Ontario and Canada. Please unmute yourself and, uh, and give us some of your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks very much, Judy. And first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Professor Giuliano for her great presentation. So much uh, to think about. At the beginning of um, Jan's presentation, she touched on the policy context in California that really helped drive this kind of study. And we heard that California is a pioneer when it comes to setting ambitious regulations to mitigate air pollution, to reduce emissions from trucks, um, and to really cultivate that, um, that culture of demonstration, piloting, and testing. And when we think about what's the art of the possible in Canada um, and what the problem that we have here in Canada, the reality is freight transport, um, similar to, to that of the States, has increased. And when you look at the, the latest national inventory report, we see that 154% uh, increase in freight emissions since 1990. Um, and when you drill down even more specifically, we know that 11% of Canada's GHG emissions come from freight trucks. So the problem is quite clear and the time for action is now. Um, and so similar to the kind of ambition that we're seeing in California, um, it's time to have ambitious climate action um, in Canada. And we're glad to see the federal government have an ambitious target when it comes to setting emission reduction targets by 2030. Excuse me, I have something in my eye. Um, and through their, their latest climate plan um, and their commitment to achieve net zero by 2030. Um, the GTHA, right here uh, in the GTHA, we know that municipalities are also setting really ambitious climate targets, but the reality is we're not on track to meeting that. So I think what we need to see and what I'd like, love to discuss is how can we have a comprehensive and climate plan to set those stringent regulations similar to that, those that we see in California um, to really drive that, um, that transition to a cleaner transportation system. So I'll leave it there and look forward to the, the discussion. There's a challenge. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Aman Johal to Aman, please uh, unmute yourself and join us. Aman is Vice President of Pride Group Enterprises, where he has taken the lead on Pride EV, the company's venture into electric vehicles. I said that Pemina had immersed themselves in it. Pride, Pride is it. 
Pride operates truck sales and rentals and good deliveries and logistics. They recently placed large orders for Tesla semis and workhorse delivery vans. A man, we've heard about the challenges of going electric. Would you tell us about Pride's electrification strategy and, and what you're thinking about after that talk? Thank you. Yep, for sure. And uh, maybe I'll start off kind of um, just with a quick introduction on what Pride does um, in transport and all of our business uh, divisions, right? So um, as Judy mentioned, we're, we're in truck sales, uh, truck rental, truck leasing, uh, fleet management, as well as operating our own transportation and logistics company. Um, so, you know, we have our arms around kind of the whole trucking and class eight, uh, as well as medium duty transportation um, space in Canada, right? Um, as well as the U.S., right? So, I mean, the, the kind of unique thing about us is, you know, we, we're a dealer, so we have the equipment and experience with the equipment, and we also operate the equipment ourselves, right? So, and kind of what, I, what I'd like to say is, you know, everything um, that Jen brought up in her research is exactly kind of what our experience on the ground has been to date, right? So, um, you know, there, there's, everyone wants to go EV. It's an exciting time. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges, right? And there's aggressive mandates and timelines set up by different governments, uh, different private companies that want to have, you know, all of their transportation uh, be carbon neutral by 2030 or other dates, um, including long haul transport, right? Which is, which is, you know, the, it's an aggressive goal. So um, some of the challenges that we're really up against here in Canada is kind of limited funding from the government. Uh, for EVs, because as Jen mentioned, um, the price of these EV trucks are about three times the price of conventional, right? So, um, and, you know, of course, customers, um, whether they're freight customers or their fleets, um, you know, they, they want to go EV, but they don't want to pay three times the price because, you know, the, the margins in transport are just not there, right? So that's one of the biggest challenges that we're up against. And we really need some support from the government um, whether it's on a federal or provincial level to kind of help offset some of those uh, those costs, right? Um, the other challenge is the application, right? As Jen mentioned, um, you know, EVs right now, because of the battery range and the routes that they um, run on, uh, you really need a plan for what the driver is going to do when he starts his day, right? Like his or her day. Um, you know, it can't be, you know, we, we send them to a and then send them to point B, send them to point C, and then we decide what we're going to do, kind of how traditionally freight companies manage their uh, transportation. It really has to be a dedicated route. The driver has to know he's going to start at 9 a.m. and be, you know, finish his trips by 5 p.m., right? So, uh, and nothing can kind of go wrong because you don't want a truck stranded somewhere without battery life, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, it, that, that won't work. Um, you know, th there's just a lot of unknowns right now. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to step up and be one of the leaders um, and, you know, do a lot of that kind of groundwork so that other companies, other customers are comfortable uh, with EVs. And, um, you know, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a challenge for all of these reasons. And uh, I'm open to answering any questions that anyone may have. Uh, excellent, and thank you, Aman. Um, and I'm sure there will be questions. A reminder to the audience to please post your questions in the chat. We're going to invite uh, Professor Giuliano to please join our panel for a discussion on the opportunities and the challenges of getting emissions to zero. And after we have a short discussion, we'll turn to the audience for Q&A. So just a reminder, please post some questions in the chat. We really, I'm sure there are people sitting out there with lots of questions. So Jen's with us, Carolyn and Aman. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, goodness. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, well, we know that Canada and the US recently adva uh, advanced ambitious new targets. And it's being said that this will require dramatic changes in the energy and transportation sectors. Uh, in Canada, the transportation sector, a very large emitter, and as Carolyn said, freight, a large part of it. So. Uh, we're going to have bright lights shone on this industry to see what how contributions is going to make to reducing emissions. And yet, uh, Jen's research has told us about the challenges a man is experiencing these, and Carolyn has pointed out the, the challenges in making policy. So, um, Carolyn, maybe you could start off by just talking about if we're not on track and you could have um, two wishes, what would your two wishes be? Oh, only two. Um, okay, well, I think that uh, to start off, I and Amon also alluded to this in his opening remarks, 
Um, there needs to be greater investment in this transition in addition to the regulations I kind of touched on in the beginning, uh, whether it's um, GHG performance standards um, coupled with um, regulations that drive towards zero emission technologies or, or near zero technologies uh, that needs to be set at a national level. But that also needs to be paired with investments and in not just from uh, different levels of government, but also how can we mobilize um, the private uh, sector in terms of helping with, um, as Jen mentioned, there's a high cost with this transition, uh, managing the stranded assets, investing in the charging infrastructure or refueling stations uh, to the vehicles and to the supporting uh, services and, and ecosystem. So um, there's a, a lot of challenges, but if I were to touch on two, I would say increased regulation to send those market signals of the change. Uh, and secondly, greater investment by both public and private sectors. Thank you. And, and Aman, as you're going down this road, what if you could wish for two things, what would those two things be? Um. From our point of view, I guess one of the um, biggest uh, kind of things would be public, uh, more public infrastructure for charging the vehicles, right? So, you know, as, as we send drivers on different routes, um, especially when you look at long call, uh, I just saw a question pop up about long call. Um, it would be very helpful if there are chargers available, like we have car chargers along routes, right? And they have to be superchargers so that, you know, trucks are able to get charged um, you know, to a good level of battery life within 30 to 45 minutes, right? Um, and drivers can kind of continue on. So um, it, it's not really long haul where I would say the driver is going from Ontario to California, but, you know, 500 to 1,000 mile trips, um, you know, it'll make them more, well, it'll make us come closer to accomplishing goals, right? So uh, investment in public uh, infrastructure is definitely one. And, um, you know, the, the second would be, again, back to the funding, right? So whether it's uh, with the infrastructure, or whether it's, um, you know, rebates for the EV vehicles, um, you know, there has to, that has to be in place. Because like I said, um, you know, co large corporations who have budgets for EV vehicles, um, you know, th they can afford these, right? And even if financially it doesn't make sense, um, you know, they'll still be able to do it. But private companies who really, you know, look at their bottom line and depend on kind of, you know, making making that margin to keep going, um, it, it doesn't make sense for them right now. Right? So those would be the two biggest. Big ones. And now, uh, Professor Giuliano, Jen, California is a leader in this. Having heard what, from Carolyn Aman, do you have any ideas of... Uh, you know, lessons learned in California and how we go down this yeah. road. Clearly, we have ways to go down this road. Well, I, I, yeah, I do. Um, and one of them is um, the kind of the policy strategies uh, that Carolyn is talking about. Uh, one of the things that I think is quite unique uh, in California uh, is that because there's this long history of pollution regulation, there's a long tradition and there's a lot of infrastructure, you know, institutional infrastructure uh, that's focused on pollution reduction. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's the sort of carrot and stick, you need both. So some of you know that California has a cap and trade uh, operation. Uh, and that cap and trade operation generates significant revenues. And the state's been able to use some of those revenues to um, fund these demonstration projects, to fund subsidy programs, et cetera. Um, they are not funding at an adequate level going to what uh, Amon has said. Uh, there's there's not enough funding in there to, to actually significantly move the needle in terms of people's willingness to, to buy these trucks. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the technology is moving because of the demonstrations and so on. So I would, I would kind of, you know, put that out there as 
um, the sort of policy approach is that you need both. You wouldn't be able to just do it with regulation because um, it's, you know, and some, some of this stuff is simply not feasible um, at this point. So that was, that's one comment. Um, the other comment is on um, the infrastructure side. Uh, this is something that California is grappling with so far ineffectively uh, because the ambitions uh, in terms of what is expected to be accomplished um, simply presume uh, a charging infrastructure and a grid capacity uh -huh. Uh -huh. that would handle this. Um, it's not at all clear that the grid capacity is there, especially because um, the, uh, the charging is liable to take place in sort of geographic clusters where these warehousing and distribution centers are. So there's gonna be these huge drains on a small portion of the grid and we don't know how that's gonna go yet. Uh, so I think one of the things that California needs to do and hasn't done yet is to come up with an infrastructure plan as part of, a part of the whole program, you gotta have the infrastructure plan. Um, as Amon said, uh, he, you can, he said it, you know, you can put these things on dedicated routes, uh, but nothing can go wrong. And as a result of that, the people that we talk to um, keep these trucks really close to home. So uh -huh. they are building in a lot of risk, you know, risk avoidance um, uh -huh. because they don't really trust the technology and because they could get stranded. And in fact, some of these demo trucks have been stranded because they've run out of charge. So those two things are what I would, those would be my wishes. Thank you. And I think it's really interesting. The point you make about demo projects is a really interesting one. I think we've had experience in the region here of some successful ones, but we seem to have to see it for ourselves sometimes rather than taking lessons learned from elsewhere. I mean, I wonder Absolutely. what would you, what do you think? Do you, do you need to see that happen here do, or do the, the lessons learned elsewhere will help you? Absolutely. Um, I would say that 100%. Just to give you one small example, you live in a cold place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Batteries don't do well in cold places. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, these heavy duty batteries are going to be much more of a problem in your environment than they are in Southern California. So that's just one little thing, right? Um, your delivery patterns are probably very different. The share of um, trips that are short may be very different. Um, and um, you, you gotta think about the companies who need to uh, know how to maintain these vehicles. Um, things like that. So uh, where's the training gonna come from? So there's kind of, you have to kind of set up the whole system and that system tends to be kind of very local specific. Yeah, and we won't, we won't even get into the whole ecosystem of, of the, like as you mentioned, the training. Um, there is an exciting project in Ontario to build a battery, an electric battery, um, soup to nuts from sourcing straight through production with all Ontario based materials. That's exciting to see that we can do it. Um, so that, but that's very much a research project by the Automotive Parts Association. Um, truly demonstration that battery won't run, I don't think. Um, but we've, we've miles and miles to go. I'm, I'm going to ask just, I think, one more question before, uh, before opening up the floor, because the, the questions are coming in very quickly. Um, we're, at the, we're at a university. Uh, we're surrounded here by university researchers, as well as our partners in industry and government. Um, it seems that innovation, um, Jen, you called it technology forcing, uh, is going to, going to have to be part of the solution here. Um, uh, a man from the needs that you see, uh, Carolyn, in your thoughts, and, and Jen, what you know, if you were funding this, where would you be putting our focus and our research attention, our research dollars? Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 
I would love to see a demonstration project um, also in the GTHA. And it's really great to see the Smart Freight Center um, be a leader and U of T also being in all the different academic institutions in our region, play a big part in identifying um, you know, goods movement as a key policy issue. Um, you know, we have a demonstration project in Alberta, the Alberta Zero Emission Truck Electrification Collaboration. That's a $15 million project and it's still ongoing. And it would be really cool to see something um, that's similar to Jen's project in California, that's kind of similar to what's happening in the West Coast here in the region. And, and of course that would require um, cross-sectoral collaboration and partnership. But I think as what we've learned from this presentation is that you need the operational data to really inform public policy development. And I think we need something homegrown uh, where we can learn from it and we can kind of continually adjust based on conditions. So um, that that's a key takeaway, I think, from this presentation. Yeah, and, and, maybe, and maybe with pride. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, and that is that, first of all, I think we've been underselling hybrid as the as a middle term option. Um, we could put hybrid electric vehicles on the road tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, and we would be reducing greenhouse gases tomorrow. Um, Whereas we cannot do that with electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like the first thing we need to think about is kind of what is the objective? And you know what I know about climate change is that um, taking a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere today is way better than doing it 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I, I'm feeling like we need to be more flexible in terms of the technologies that we're looking at. Um, from the trucking point of view, uh, what I hear is they would love to do that, but they don't want to be told that five years from now you have to sell all those trucks and go to electric. Mm -hmm. You know, don't make it even, even more expensive for us. Uh, the second thing is that I also think that we should be investing in more, more research on the uh, fuel cell side, the hydrogen fuel cell side, uh, because that technology, though hugely expensive today, performs way better in this sector. Uh -huh. So I'm feeling like... Um, I'd like to see the conversation <clears throat> be broader than it is. And maybe a solution based, not so technology focused. Let's, let's see what we have, how many ways we have to get there and what we're really trying to achieve. Really, yeah. really great points. A man, if you were, somebody was doing, if you could hire a researcher, what would they be working on for you? Maybe you can. <laughs> yeah, I would think it would be, um, you know, more towards um, data, kind of like Carolyn was uh, touching on. So, you know, right now operating um, EVs, um, you know, we're going to start very shortly here. Um, it, we're kind of relying on our own internal team to kind of, you know, test something out and then learn from it, right? So um, we, there's not that data to kind of really rely on, right? Like such as how does um, winter impact uh, battery performance, right? So, and, um, you know, just things like that where there, it's just all unknown to us. Um, and yeah, like there's studies coming from California, um, but I mean, it's on shorter routes, um, warmer weather, um, you know, Tesla's doing a lot of them with uh, moving their own freight and you don't know kind of you know, the weight of the loads and those kind of things, right? And, and weight's going to be a huge impact in Canada mm -hmm. because the weight restrictions mm -hmm. are higher than they are in the U.S., right? So how is that going to affect the battery life? So those are things that, you know, as of now, there's no answer and we kind of have to go and test those, right? So when we talk to our customers about electrifying their freight, um, you know, we're not really able to give them clear answers on a lot of these questions, right? And we just say, hey, it's going to be kind of a test and learn environment. So as we learn things, we'll pass on the knowledge, right? But it would be, you know, good to definitely have some support on the research side. 
And and kudos to your company for stepping up here. That's 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 really really remarkable because, as you pointed out, the margins have really just never been there in this business. Yeah. And as we know now, tra transportation and goods movement is going to come under a spotlight. I think Jen's number was the number of vehicles will increase by a factor of 2.6 to satisfy our demand. So the, our problem will get bigger uh, if we don't address it with some urgency. And um, as, our, as the talk made clear today and your comments make clear, there are a lot of challenges ahead of us. So um, thank you, panelists. I'm going to turn now to, uh, to the Q&A uh, because the questions have been piling up. <laughs> and I'll try and pull, put them together a little bit. I hope I don't do any smishing that is inappropriate. Um, uh, Jen, somebody asked if you could comment on implications for long haul. I think the hydrogen might be part of it. Um, and what about on some highways? Is there an opp opportunity to electrify some routes? Uh, <clears throat> yes, and that's been actually talked about. And um, we have, well, let's start from... Um, the problem we have right now with and what we'll have in the future uh, is that you have to carry all this weight around in the form of energy. Uh, and so you're using energy to carry your energy, uh, which is the range problem, right? Um, so it's very logical to think, what if we don't have to carry the energy? What if we can um, do something that's sort of a pseudo rail system, or you know, we have an electrified roadway or something uh, that would allow for charging to be constant and would free us from carrying it around. Um, Siemens is doing a demonstration in Southern California for um, essentially what looks like a truck trolley system where you've got the electric charging in overhead gantries. Uh, and so the trucks are going to be are charged via these gantries. Um, so there is, it's not a crazy idea. Uh, there is research going on to see um, how that how that might happen. Uh, again, that's a ways out. Um, because not only do you need the technology, but then you need to build it. Um, so these, these demonstrations, again, it's all about testing, right? R and D and testing. Um, they are, there are things out there that you're thinking in that direction. And another couple of people asked, uh, granted that these are heavy batteries, could they be swapped out? Yeah. Um, there are actually, there've been a, care, a couple of studies in Europe um, looking at, you know, scenarios where you would swap out batteries. Um, that's feasible. It does have, again, some challenges because it takes time to swap out a battery. They're heavy, so you need equipment and so on. Um, so it's not as if you're stopping to fill your tank up with gas, it's something more than that. Um, so it is possible and some people are thinking that that might be, you know, another way that you um, refuel these things, at least in some instances. And the good thing about it is that if you did that, uh, you know, suppose you could do that quickly with our firm too. Um, you just swap out the battery and then you're charging the battery while the truck is still moving around and then it comes back again. So yes, that's, that's part of the puzzle. Uh, we had a question. So the, the battery creates a, another challenge with the loaded weight of the vehicle and weight restrictions. If the, and if our demand as consumers goes up, the requirement for more vehicles, we had a question about um, have you done any work that considers the full life cycle cost of this and the cost of those additional the emissions cost of those additional vehicles and where that happens, where those emissions occur? Um, great question. And I, I get to therefore plug one of my PhD students. Excellent. Um, who is doing who is addressing that question in her dissertation. Um, so she's looking at the life cycle costs um, for electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell, uh, and hybrids uh, to 
to go to actually do those calculations and see where we are. Uh, I don't have any results for you yet, but this, this person asked the right question. And that means, I guess, that even, uh, you know, we think of tradition, the traditional ways we've made manufactured vehicles, we may have to think of other things like light weighting and, and uh, alternative processes and materials for driving down the emissions of our manufacturing. So, you know, that's exactly. the interesting thing about transportation mobility right, right now. It's not just about transportation. It seems to touch just about everything yes uh in our lives and it's going to be a, a real global yeah. challenge for us for us to achieve um there are a lot of people with uh, with good practical knowledge on the call and we have a question about um uh i'll read it out of their targeted truck submarkets where loads would cube out before they would weigh out that would be used to make inroads and we would um, get away from the weight thing uh that happens more in local delivery uh, and that's why uh, we've been able to make more uh, progress uh, in the medium, medium uh, size truck market rather than the heavy truck. Um, it's usually a weight out um, with, with drayage and short, the type of short haul that we were looking at. And maybe Aman has something to say on that. Sure, please, Aman. Yeah, no, there's, um, yeah, definitely in the kind of last mile space um, that happens in the courier space. Um, when you look at full truck loads, um, 53 foot trailers, um, you know, th there there are definitely customers who I would say do always cube out before they weigh out. Um, but again, it's usually commodities that are very kind of low value. Um, and, and it goes back to just how aggressive are those companies um, in supporting transport companies to go um, electric, right? Because, you know, it, there has to be something given back to the transport company for, for taking that step and absorbing these extra costs, right? So, yeah, um, I, I think that there is a market there of customers that do cube out before they weigh out and can be a target, which is, you know, a good approach for trucking companies to kind of approach those customers and say, hey, you know, we're electrifying our fleet. Are you interested in participating in some of these routes uh, with your free? So, yeah, that, that definitely is, uh, is a good opportunity. And, and what, do you, what do you do lease and sell or you will be? What is the interest out there among uh, in our region and owner operators and fleet operators? So, so far it's been very little um, from owner operators and fleet operators, um, private fleets. Um, all of the interest so far has came from large organizations, right? So global companies, um, you know, that have budgets set aside um, just for to spend on EVs or to spend towards their goal for um, going carbon neutral by a certain date, right? So, um, but when it comes to kind of the individual trucker or a fleet of five trucks up to even 200 trucks, 300 trucks, um, right now they're they're looking at the cost and it's just not making sense, right? Um, so, so, you know, very, it's, uh, you know, like Jen said, medium duty, last mile, it's, it's a lot uh, far ahead than, you know, highway transport is uh, with 53 foot trailers and all that. Um, and I, ha I have a question here, and, and um, it's a, a kind of a policy question. But back to your study, Jen. Uh, did you include the cost of carbon in your study? And I guess if we talk about changing costs uh, here, then the cost of carbon will be a, be a driver. Um, th that was one of the things we I wanted to make clear, and that is that we looked at cost effectiveness, not cost benefit analysis. Um, because we did not, we didn't take, first of all, we didn't take the extra step of saying, let's assign a value to carbon. We could, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, haven't done it yet, um, but it would be more appropriate to do a more formal benefit cost analysis if we did it that way. Uh, so, uh, you know, the best we can do is just say, you know, you saw the numbers, you know, if it's a thousand dollars to remove a gram of carbon, um, does that, you know, how does that weigh out? Is that a good number for us? Yeah. 
Um, and imagine these, I'm going to ask a quick one. Imagine these vehicles are quiet. Our experience of electric cars is they're quiet. Um, does that pose safety issues? Unfortunately, yes. Um, that I think you've all seen this with, with uh, electric vehicles. Um, turns out that they get into more um, crashes than not electric vehicles um, because they're silent and people don't hear them. Um, I'm guessing it would be less of an issue with trucks because trucks make so much noise just rolling on the road. Uh -huh. um, so you, you know, it'd be kind of unusual not to see or hear a truck. And it, so I'm going to close up by giving Carolyn and Aman a question to ask, an opportunity to ask a quick question with a quick response because they've been such great participants here and there must be something they'd like to ask. So Carolyn, you got a quick one? Um, well, my question was kind of around the, the cost slide that you showed, which was so compelling. When you look at the, the scenario with battery electric, um, you know, it's clear that emissions uh, you know, reduction uh, capabilities is, is significant. But when you look at the cost, it's more compelling, as you say, to do the, the natural gas um, hybrid. Um, I'm wondering if you included some of the financial incentives, like the HVIP program, when you considered your cost analysis and whether you have any insights to share on uh, advising adjustments to uh, programs that are directed at reducing the cost of alternative? Uh, that's a good point. Um, the cost is the cost, no matter who pays it, right? So um, if we subsidized, we could get more private firms to buy them, um, but somebody's still paying for them, whether that's the taxpayer or somebody. It's the money's coming from somewhere. Um, so that's actually the reason that we didn't do that. Um, it was more important to sort of just lay out what these costs are and then we could talk later about um, how would you deal with them. Last question to you, Aman. Um, Jen, I'd like to ask, um, in your opinion, um, California, how far advanced would you say in terms of years or, or time um, or is California compared to some of the other states in the US or when you look at Ontario um, as an example? Um, I've been, it's hard to put a year number on it, but yeah. um, if you look at all the things we've been doing, I'd say at least 10. Now it doesn't mean that it would take 10 years for mm -hmm. people to catch up because- mm -hmm. Thank goodness. You know, and in a sense, California is incurring the, the early problems and the early delays and the early experiences that everybody else can learn from. So yeah. um, it, should, it should be much easier for the next person in line. Yeah. What, what, a, what a great way to close them and thank you because we can say thank you for that. Yeah. And to, you, <laughs> to California. Been a On fun top of everything, I, everything else we would say thank you for. Thank you. And it's been a fun discussion. And I've, I've been looking at all the questions in the, in the um, chat box. And I'm very impressed. They're great questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, and I expected they would be great questions. Uh, goods movement uh, of great interest in our region. Uh, and lots of focus on it, and we knew that this would. That's why we. That's why we invited you. <laughs> well, thank you. And that's why we expected a crowd. So I'm going to say, on behalf of the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering, uh, UTREE, and the Smart Freight Center, thank you to our distinguished lecturer for 2021, Genevieve Giuliano, and to our panelists, Carolyn and Aman. Thank you so much. Thanks also to the Department of Civil and Mineral, Mineral Engineering for organizing and hosting the Distinguished Lecture Series. We benefit it from it every year as an opportunity to gather a group of people to talk about something important and interesting to people and goods movement in our region. Thank you very much. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us. If uh, I'm gonna do a shameless plug. There. Um, 
if you enjoyed this talk and you'd like to know more about what we do, then please visit our various websites to see what we have going on. You could have subscribed to our newsletters, um, Civil and Miller Engineering at University of Toronto, the Smart Freight Centre, and the Transportation Research Institute. We hope to see you again at another event. We hope you'll keep up with our updates. We hope you'll stay safe and happy and well, and we see you again soon. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks so much, Judy. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Giuliano. Great talk.